study night at the museum. There's a mummy eating yogurt in the break room. I glance up from my hash finished homework. Nat's propping herself up in the doorframe. Her face is white as a sheet. She looks as if she's just seen a ghost, which if you're inclined to believe her, is exactly what happened. Well, somewhat. I stare at her across the dim light of the library, trying to think up a witty reply that will elevate my social status to cool. Something along the lines of, hey, what else is it gonna eat? Marty's tuna sub reeks. Or you see, this is why we both need coffee. But when I open my mouth, all the words I could say stay stuck in my throat. Honestly, I'm hurt. I've had my fair share of hazing before with how many times I've changed schools, but I really thought I was making strides in befriending that. Maybe she's planning this with her real friends. Oh, I know. Let's see if Kate is scared of ghosts. No, mummies. Wait, do they know? Still, I've never seen Nat so pale before. Her face is so drained it's gone practically monochromatic. Granted, I haven't known her long at all, but I doubt even a total stranger would miss these red flags. You okay there? I ask. She shakes her head, oh, so slowly. No, definitely not okay there. She must be a terrific actress if this really is a prank. I get up, cut my way to her in three strides, and help her to the nearest chair. I hit the main lights. For the first time, I'm glad the Natural History Museum has a cold, sterile library rather than the ornate Woodian one I'm always dreaming of. The stark fluorescent beams chased away the shadows on Nat's face. Her lips are moving, but she's not saying anything. I thought I'd read enough about quivering lips in fiction to recognize it happening in real life, but this is so much worse. I'm not sure exactly what has gone wrong. Something terrifying and horrible, but a mummy of all things? Impossible. This can't be happening. There has to be a reasonable explanation for this. There always is a reasonable explanation. I'll stick with prank. Let's see how far this goes. Are you going into shock? I ask, as if she'd know, as if either of us would know what to do if she was. Do you have any water? She finally managed to say something, but her voice is so harsh it, cr uh, hoarse it cracks a little. Just tea, it's cold. I hand her my thermos and she chugs it down in a single gulp, too quickly. She chokes and coughs, sending spray over my arms. Easy, I say, wiping the saliva from my skin, gross. Have you eaten anything recently? Nat shakes her head. I was hoping for something from the vending machine, but the mummy, her eyes go wide again. I don't like this feeling in my chest, the rising heartbeat at the sight of her. She's so scared, her fear is catching, which is why this absolutely cannot be real. This has to end now. I'm not falling for this. I drop back down in my chair and she looks at me sharp, sharply. What are you talking about? She's staring at me, still putting on the act. It's so convincing I'm starting to give in, but I can't. Oh, come on, do I have to say it? I'm the new kid, it's Friday night. This is some elaborate prank. Her face falls. I thought it'd be impossible for her to look any more haunted, but whoops, now she's left ghost, left ghost territory and looks outright corpse-like. Seriously? Her word is a whisper, an earnest, pained whisper. I'm actually feeling sorry for her. Kate, please. Okay, fine, I roll my eyes. Show me the mummy then, but if your football buddies think they can get the drop on me. I expect her to try to convince me more, but instead she quietly slips off her chair and waits for me to take the lead which I do, grabbing my phone off the desk and clutching it tight to my chest as I go. I won't be taken by surprise. I don't know if this is a good plan or not, but at the very least, I'm stretching my legs, even if it is just a hop and a skip down the hallway to the break room. I've been crouched for hours over that desk, reading everything through those old books and reference papers that Dr. Lauren Eagleman, director of Egyptology here, has pulled out for us. I've literally been taking notes until my wrist feels sprained for the past 10 days. I need this college credit. I can't have anyone put that in jeopardy. I'm not supposed to be here anywhere near this stinking town. My parents decided last month that their research was more important than family and deposited me and my little brother Tegan with our grandparents before they caught a cargo ship to Antilles. I was supposed to be finishing my senior year with my friends, kicking butt at soccer and dominating the field. Instead, I'm forced to take every available AP class in a desperate attempt to look good for universities now that I'm out of the running for a sports scholarship. Apparently, there's no room for me on the school's new team. I can't just come out of nowhere and squeeze myself into places where I don't belong. The field isn't the only place that doesn't have room for me. I'm joining classes midway through the term, which means most projects have already started. My new AP English teacher runs this project every year, partnered with different universities, sending her students to affiliated museums to give them real world research experience and connections for potential summer jobs. Since I showed up late, I didn't get to choose where I was assigned, which is how I got paired with Nat, working in the back library of the Natural History Museum at 9 p.m., reading about scarab beetles for hours and hours without a drop of coffee in sight not the senior year I was dreaming of. We're not even meant to stay this late. 
Nat's plan for our project is so overwhelming. She just had to ask for extra time on site. Dr. Eagleman was thrilled, thrilled to give us access. It's not like we're running around the museum floor after hours though. We just stay in staff areas. Marty, the security guard, is the only other person here at this time. And he checks on us once in, once an hour. So I'm literally the only person inconvenienced by Nat. And on Valentine's Day too. Not that I had to cancel any plans, but having the option would have been nice. Maybe Nat planned this because she didn't want to admit she's single on a night like this. 30 seconds later, we reached the break room. It was once an animal research lab back before the biology department moved to a larger space on the university campus. So it has a big glass window in the door. While it sucks to feel like a fish in a bowl every time you take a snack break, knowing everyone can see you slacking off, the window does have its perks, especially right now when it means I can see clearly into the break room to the mummy currently licking the last of the yogurt out of the cup. Oddly enough, my first reaction is to be rather peeved because that's my yogurt and I was really looking forward to it. My second reaction is pure and utter panic. It takes every ounce of courage I have not to take to my heels and run away. Ancient linen wraps span the mummy's body head to toe, worn thin in some areas where they hang off in tangled strips, revealing skin that's wrinkly, coppery brown like old leather. Its hands are bound tight like mitts, but it still manages to hold a spoon? Its black hair is long and surprisingly shimmery, but it's the face that is truly traumatizing. In the movies, mummies' faces are always wrapped up so you can't see a thing. Only their mouths remain so they can moan and groan and make generally terrifying sounds. But the being before me has a face. There's obvious mounds and indents where the features should be, gouges revealing muscle. There are two slits where the eyes are, like the mummy is squinting as it tries to clean the cup because let's be honest, it's clearly enjoying my strawberry yo play. The mummy is alive. And as far as I know, mummies aren't meant to be walking around museums or walking around at all for that matter. This is uncharted territory. Whatever brought it back from the dead screwed with the laws of nature. Shit, I say, it's all I can manage not to panic. My hands are trembling so much I can't keep my phone steady as I press it to the glass window. The mummy's in full view on my camera app through my jittery fingers and making the image shaky. I start recording immediately. What are you doing? Nat asks. Filming, no one's gonna believe us otherwise. I know from experience, well, my parents' experience, how much crap paranormal truthers get for their terrible video evidence. One thing mom and dad never seem to grasp is that recording a reaction to a ghost isn't the same thing as actually getting the ghost itself. My phone is always on me, so I have no excuse for letting this get away. Nat and I stop beneath the window in silence as we watch my screen. The mummy laps up the dregs of my late night snack with a tongue that shouldn't be there. None of it should be there. What do we do? Nat's voice is a harsh whisper. How should I know? You're the one with muscles. I didn't think she noticed. The heat on my face is either from my terror or my blushing. So you want me to go there and beat up the 2000 year old mummy? That's your plan? A mummy, which I should mention, shouldn't be alive or eating anything? 5,000. What? It's a 5,000 year old mummy. Nat's word tumble out so fast they're tripping over each other. First dynasty, come on, you should know this. It's the only mummy in the whole museum. Well, um, how do we know it's the same mummy that's meant to be on display, hmm? What other mummy could it be? And it's eating my yogurt. Further evidence Marty's tuna sub is inedible to anyone. We don't have time for this. My arms are still shaking, holding my phone up at the window. My back's beginning to ache from hunkering down. I chance a discreet look through the window and my heart skips a terrible beat. The break room is empty. The discarded yogurt cup on the table is the only evidence the creature was ever here. Oddly, this isn't reassuring. What's worse than finding a mummy in your break room? Finding one, than losing it.